You're watching TVO. Hello, I'm Enrico Gruen, and this week on Second Nature, we'll talk to author Douglas Adams about his book, Last Bed. Ah, greetings, prisoners of gravity. Hello down there. This is Commander Rex interrupting this channel. Wait, did he just say Douglas Adams? Adams wrote The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. He created Marvin the Paranoid Android, which is perfect because this week I wanted to talk about robots. Artificial intelligence? No, Nancy, I don't want to talk about that. Today, it's robots. Hit it, Nancy. Nancy, hit it. See? Give me a robot any day. Rising anti-Semitism in Eastern Europe has voted English only signed 40,000 tons of oil with PCBs blew up the ozone layer today. I was going through all my stuff, my, my comics and my tapes and my books, looking for something to eat. A bag of chips, some gum, a comic. And I found this old copy of Robotics World. I love robots. I bought this because I thought it was a collection of science fiction stories. But it turned out to be about real robots. And you know, when someone has their own magazine, they're important. No, Nancy. <laughs> Ignore my computer. She's just proof that machines can't think. The robot is, after all, kind of pathetic. Pathetic? Uh, it's kind of a slave. Slave? Uh, and... What's much more interesting is true autonomous intelligence. And that's why people think about aliens, because it contains the quality of the unknown. Whereas the robot is something we made, and therefore it's like us, except a sort of a bad carbon copy. Bad carbon copy? No! Robots are great! The word robot comes from the 1921 play R.U.R. by Carl Capek. Capex robots were artificial humans, but soon robots meant mechanical people. The man who defied robots in science fiction is Isaac Asimov. He's written a whole slew of books about robots. Asimov invented the three laws of robotics in the early 1940s. Rule one, a robot may not injure a human being or, through an action, allow a human being to come to harm. Two, a robot must obey the orders given it by human beings, except where such orders will conflict with the first law. And three, a robot must protect its own existence so long as such protection does not conflict with the first law or the second law. Then, Asimov explored all the problems that robots could get into trying to obey three simple laws. And now other writers are taking Asimov's robots and writing about them. Okay, they're not Shakespeare, but it proves people love robots. Probably people feel that it's a mined out area. Or it may just be a fad. These things come and go. Sorry, wrong tape. There we go. I want George Zabrowski, the editor of the Science Fiction Writers of America, bulletin. There's a number of writers who put their trademark on robot stories. Uh, Clifford Simak, Isaac Asimov. Um, Eastern Press is going to be doing a book by uh, the Eastern European science fiction writer Stanislav Lem called The Siberiad, which are cybernetic fables. And these are robotic stories. There's another book called Robotic Fables. There are robot stories that continue to be written. Um, some of the cyber, so-called cyberpunk writers are doing robot stories. Uh, robotics and artificial intelligence, the more general field, is, is a big, big area of science fiction. I knew it. See, Nancy, robots still have a vital role to play in SF. Our helper, at our beck and call, our servant, our slave, not our slave, our, our, our friend. Yes, mankind's best friend, sort of like an aluminum lassie. <laughs> It's an area of, of human possibility where we will actually create a child intelligence that, is, um, that grows out of us technologically 
and which we, we will then raise and which may one day surpass us and force us to live on its gifts. Sorry, just a, a technical science. glitch there. We'll just no we'll let it pass this part here. <laughs> Nancy, give me back control of this. Nancy! Nancy! It's terrifying. No! This is my illegal broadcast. We're going to talk about robots. Lots of people love robots. Douglas Adams loves robots. Douglas Adams is best known for his hilarious cult classic, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, in which aliens demolish Earth to make way for an interstellar freeway. And one of his wildest characters was Marvin, the paranoid android. Douglas Adams is on second nature, so I'll just disconnect myself. A new book. Last chance to see on the cover a Komodo dragon, some little midget people here. But what's this book all about, really? Tell us about it for those at home who might not have read it yet. As much as anything else, it was to educate myself. And uh, all, I mean, any teacher will tell you the best way of learning something, the best, best way of understanding and finding out about something is to have to explain it to somebody else. So this is uh, essentially what the, the book is about. Marvelous, I'm sure. Douglas, let's go back. July 9th, 1986. You were in Toronto having breakfast. You had eggs for breakfast with Brian Linehan. Sorry to interrupt, but uh, I want to talk to Douglas Adams. Who said that? You who? I'm trying to do an interview here. Yeah, well, I got something important, so I'm cutting you off and hijacking this signal. Yeah, Outrage. yeah. Outrage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wally, it's that bloody pirate broadcaster again. Yo. Would you get off the air? No, I want to... You'll never work in this town again. Look, would you shut up, you pretentious oh, bore? shut up yourself. Where's Stuart McLean when Is you need him? worse than the CBC budget cut? Go on. I'll be in my winnie, Wally. Fine. Outrage. Take your winnie and wally Outrage. it. Hello, Douglas. It's Commander Rick, calling from space. In Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, I love Marvin the Paranoid Android, but will we ever really have robots like Marvin? The moment we start trying to teach language to a box of reconstituted sand, we begin to discover it's much more complicated than we ever thought it was, because we've never had to ask ourselves quite how complicated it is, because anybody we've ever tried to teach it to has, has kind of been 90% of the way there already, or 99% of the way there. And a, and a computer is nowhere there, it's just sort of sitting there. No idea what you're talking about. And we find the more and more we try and explain to a computer what language is, and the reason we want to do that is because, contrary to what um, uh, uh, we've always been led to believe that with the coming of computers, we have to become computer literate. What is actually the case is that computers have to become more and more human literate. Um, and the effort of, of trying to teach a computer language turns out to be a bottomless pit of trouble. Because the further and further down you go into it, the more you wonder what it is we understand anyway. How do we derive this information from that piece of communication? Uh, the relationship between the information and the form of the communication becomes more and more nebulous and hard to grasp. So um, um, I think the value of artificial intelligence is, in a sense, not whether we arrive there or not, but that it's a fascinating journey. Thanks, Douglas. What's all this fuss about artificial intelligence? What's wrong with robots? Boring? How can you type that? Have you seen the movie Hardware? There's this great evil robot in hardware based on a strip from the British comic 2000 AD. The earth died quickly after the Great War. The seas were deserts of radioactive dust. The skies choked by clouds of poison gas. But beyond the wastelands, a few of us survived to return to the cities, where deep in a matrix of flesh and metal, men like me, discovered a new enemy had been born. Isn't this exciting? Survival of the fittest. You call that boring? Okay, you want big numbers to crunch? How about RoboCop 1 and 2? 1 and 2 makes 3, and the can cop is so popular, they're working on RoboCop 3, and they don't do that unless they can make robo-dollars. You know what his motto is? Oh, forget it.